and welcome to Holy Family. Uh, this is our second evening of our parish mission. And if you could all rise and sing with me, Refiner's Fire. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This comes from Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It be the foundation of what we speak about tonight. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles, and to the communal life, to the breaking of the bread, and to the prayers. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this day. We thank you for calling us to be your followers, calling us to be holy, to be set apart. We thank you for the great examples of the early Christians and how they lived together, the breaking of the bread and praying and listening to the teaching of the apostles. Help us to grow into your image and likeness. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So welcome back, or welcome to your first night. So how many were here last night? And how many your first, t- first time here? There's no penalty or anything. Just uh, <laughs> We're going to do a quick review, but a, a couple uh, questions that I've had between last night and today. Uh, somebody asked me, how did your parents feel? How did your family feel when you became Catholic? And so uh, my parents always told us, so they were you know, raised, they went to church every Wednesday and Sunday in their Christian churches uh, growing up. And when they moved to Joliet, they looked for a church but just couldn't find one. So they, and they just kind of fell out of practice. So they told my brothers and I that whenever we were 18, we could choose our faith as long as we prayed about it and studied it. And so... I knew my mother would support me in anything, you know, that was legal, so I uh, <laughs> went to her first, and then uh, my dad was supportive too, uh, not only becoming Catholic, but becoming a priest, and I can tell you as the vocation director, when I worked with young men, you know, desiring to become priests, 
there were a lot of Catholic parents who weren't supportive of their kids. And so I was very blessed to have non-Catholic parents support my, my enter, entrance into the church and also entrance into the priesthood. Um, my, my oldest brother is now Catholic. My dad and my stepmom became Catholic about eight or nine years ago. My mother, I'm sure, would have been Catholic uh, had she, you know, lived longer when I was, uh, she, she died after my first year of seminary. So uh, we have a family now that's almost all Catholic starting out that, that wasn't Catholic. So uh, yeah, I'm very blessed with a, an incredible, incredible family. So let's do a little review from yesterday. So we talked about Jesus' plan. And what was Jesus' plan? He focused his energy on a few. Who was his one? John. Who were, her, who were his three? Peter, James, and John. And then, of course, the 12 and the 72. So he invested heavily in the one, three, and 12. I, did a, I had a priest challenge us one, one day. He said, I want you to go home and you know, journal who is your one. Like, who is your best friend, your closest friend in the world? Who are your three? And that would include your best friend plus two more. Who are your 12? And then if you can get the 72, great. If not, no worries. But doing that exercise was very eye-opening for me because I realized that my brothers, so my, I have one brother that lives in Denver. The other brother lives in Philadelphia. So we're, you know, a, a thousand miles apart both ways. And I found myself as a priest investing in a lot of people here, but not in my own family. And so they were not in the 12 at the time, but I started being more intentional about investing time with my brothers. And because of COVID, you know, uh, when seemingly we were locked down, I started reaching out more to them uh, via FaceTime and, and Zoom. And we actually spent more time together than we, we had prior to COVID. So it might be an exercise that you think about so you can be more intentional. Okay, who am I investing in? You know, as parents, I would imagine your, you know, your spouse and your children would be among those first uh, 12 and then adding other close friends and family members as well. So intentionality is really key. So he invested heavily in a few. Now he ministered to thousands, but that wasn't where he spent all of his time. So what can happen when we're sharing our faith is that we, if we do a shotgun approach and try to, try to invest in everybody, we really invest in no one, right? And so if we can invest in a few, but still, you know, relate to other people that are maybe outside of our 12 or 72, that's what Jesus did. We talked about uh, Bishop Hicks's vision of evangelization, catechesis, and faith in action. So we talked about evangelization is you know, coming to know Jesus at the level of the heart. The Spanish word conocer means to know a person. Then catechesis is, you know, filling our minds with, with Jesus, the saber, to know about Jesus. And so it's interesting, when, when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment, what did he say? Love the Lord your God with your whole heart, mind, and soul. And so this makes sense, that we're loving God with our hearts, and we're also loving God with our minds. And we're going to talk more about that today. How do we grow in this area? And then the faith in action to go and make disciples of all nations. That's our marching orders. So that's a, a quick review of what we, what we talked about yesterday. And we talked about this, this baseball diamond, that discipleship is... You know, like if you don't like baseball, just think about it. It's, it's in terms of, it's, it's, we're always in motion, right? As a growing disciple, you know, we need to come to know Jesus at the evangelization level. Uh, after we encounter Jesus, like, remember, we, we showed the video of, of St. Peter and the Chosen, and when he met the Messiah and he saw the miracle of the multiplication of the fish, you know, he's, he dropped to his knees and he said, you know, you're the Messiah, aren't you? And he said, I am. And so that then began the process of what Bishop Hicks would call catechesis, that three-year process that Peter spent with Jesus, getting to know more about him, falling more in love with him. And then after three years, Jesus sent Peter and the others 
on mission to put their faith into action. And so we need to go around the, the base paths first ourselves, and then to be intentional about walking with others around the base paths as well. Um, this isn't easy. And as we talked about, there's no program that says A, B, C, D, but it's really about investing in people. It's about building relationships and sharing life together and being intentional about sharing our faith life together. It could be as simple as, you know, doing a, a Bible study with a group of people that you're sharing life with. And we're going to be talking about Be Formed, what we've started in the diocese, because it, it kind of incorporates all of these aspects of what we just read in Acts 2.42. So the catechesis, this first to second base on the base paths, we're going to talk about tonight, how do, we, how do we grow in our relationship? And I want to get very practical because I don't like to stay in the clouds because you can walk away just kind of scratching your head, but what does this look like? How do we practically grow in our relationship with the Lord? I told you when I was playing baseball in college, we practiced five hours a day and we practiced every possible situation repeatedly so we knew what to do when we got into the game. The same thing is true in our, in our spiritual lives. If we, if we really invest time in our, in our spiritual lives, um, when temptations come, you recognize them for what they are and you can you know, stand up against them. But if we don't practice our faith, if we don't invest in our faith, we are, we're kind of sitting ducks for the enemy, right? So, the apostles didn't know what they signed up for when they first said yes, did they? So when Peter uh, said yes to Jesus, said, I'll, I'll follow you, we talked about last night, was, did Peter become perfect? No. Are any of us perfect after we make that initial yes? No, it, it's a process. Discipleship is a lifelong process. You and I are all constantly developing our relationship with the Lord. But that's the beauty of this. What I love about being a disciple of Jesus is I can never say I'm done. I've finished, checked the box, what's next? There's always, there's always more, right? But they were willing to follow and grow. They spent three years, as I said, listening, watching, paying attention to what Jesus did. So that three-year process. Now, you may be with someone, for example, it, it may take them 20 years to, to really, you know, give their lives to Christ. How long did St. Monica pray for her son, uh, St. Augustine? 30 years, 35? There, there were a lot of years that she spent on her knees praying for her wayward son. Uh, but her prayers were heard, and not only did he become a disciple of Jesus, but he became a saint. And so that should give us all hope. Those of you who are parents, that's one of the things I hear most commonly among people is, my children or my grandchildren have strayed from God and I don't know what to do. And I always say, your two weapons are your knees and your example. Dropping to your knees in prayer and just being a good example of, of faith. If we are grumpy Christians, Nobody wants to be like us, right? And I've had young people say, you know, mom goes to church every day and she comes back and she's grumpy the whole day. If that's what it means by going to church, I don't want anything, uh, I don't want to do anything associated with church. So we need to be, what, what do they say, a, a, a Christian that is sad it is, is a sad Christian, right? Um, and so the, the litmus test, if we're growing in our, in our relationship with Jesus, what do you think the litmus test is? What do you think people are going to see in us? Joy, love, peace, all of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, right? So if we're not growing in love, if we're not growing in joy, if we're not growing in peace, maybe we need to switch something up. Again, going back to a sports analogy, if I'm practicing a certain way hitting a baseball and it's not helping, I should stop practicing that way and try something different. And so in our spiritual lives, if something isn't working, then try something else. And it's always good to have, I know that we don't have enough spiritual directors for everybody in the diocese, but it, that's why it's good to have at least one other person in our lives that maybe, even if they're one step ahead of us in the spiritual life, that we can bounce things off of. 
I think it was St. Bernard of Clairvaux, he said, he who has himself as a spiritual director has a fool as a directee. <laughs> in other words, if we're trying to direct ourselves in the spiritual life, we're going to get lost because we justify things that we do, don't we? we? We can say, well, at least I'm not as bad as that person. Ever, ever heard that? At least I haven't killed anybody. I'm like, well, the bar is pretty low there, isn't it? Now, we all should have somebody in our lives that calls us to holiness, that calls you to be the best version of yourself. Think about if you have that person in your life, somebody that just inspires you to be the best you can be. If not, pray for that person. Pray that God sends you that person that raises the bar for you. And if you're married, hopefully you do that for each other. If you have a friend that drags you down, if you have a friend that drags you away from the Lord, that's not a friend. Your best friends are the ones that bring the best out of you, help you to be more virtuous, help you to be a better disciple of Jesus. So, let's talk about a time to grow. So we've been studying this in the diocese for the last three or four years. I've been trying to study all of the best movements that there are in the church and find what can we take, what's the best out there that we can incorporate here in our diocese. So we talked about last night Crucio. Uh, Crucio is a, a movement that came out of Spain, and it's in almost every diocese in the world now. It started back in the 1940s. I, I made a Crucio in 1993, and it was a, a game changer. So I was 26 years old. I was working for the Kane County Cougars. Uh, I was dating somebody pretty seriously, and it was on this Crucio that I came to understand the faith in a brand new way, and I came to understand the power of grace, this free gift of God that is transformative. We talked about last night, I envisioned God's grace as this torrential downpour coming down upon us. But when we're not living a virtuous life, it's like putting up an umbrella and the grace does not have any effect on us. But the more we live a life of virtue, the more we open ourselves up to this incredible free gift of God's grace, it transforms us. God's life within us transforms us, and we become more like him. And so, Crucio, there, there are three things that they focus on, uh, are piety, study, and action. Again, how many have you done Crucio here? Got a few. So piety, sometimes it has a negative connotation. In this sense, piety is a spiritual life, a prayer life. So, do you have a prayer life? Are you studying things about God, and are you putting your faith into action? You're going to start to see a convergence of all of these powerful movements. They have a lot of the same things in common. The next one is Dynamic Catholic. Any Matthew Kelly fans here? So he, he wrote a book called, uh, uh, what is it, The Signs of a Dynamic Catholic? And so he, he did a study of... He went around and asked priests, who are your most dynamic Catholics in your parish? And he sat down and interviewed, he didn't do it personally, but he had his team interview them. And what they found is that these dynamic Catholics, what percentage of people were they in the, pop, in the Catholic population? Do you remember? Seven. So seven percent of Catholics they considered dynamic Catholics. And they had four things in common. So they, they had a daily prayer life. They studied uh, good Catholic books. They were generous with their time, talent, and treasure. And they participated in evangelization. They shared their faith in some way. Again, evangelization does not mean standing on the street corner preaching. It could be simply giving somebody a good Catholic book. Here's a, here's a CD you should listen to. Here's a, here's a good podcast that you can listen to. That's evangelization. So they had those four things in common. How many of you are familiar with FOCUS, the Fellowship of Catholic University Students? This is one of the best movements going on in the Catholic Church today. It started by uh, Curtis Martin, and what they're doing is they train young adults to go onto college campuses to evangelize college students. And I can tell you, any uni University of Illinois graduates here? Nobody? Nobody? Wow. 
as a vocation director, it was the number one producer of vocations for our diocese, the University of Illinois Newman Center. And it was because they had focused missionaries there and they had dynamic priests and women religious. And so what focus uh, focuses on, <laughs> uh, three things, authentic friendship. So we talked last night about discipleship begins with building trust with another person, developing an authentic friendship with someone. It's hard to evangelize somebody that you don't know. It can happen. You know, I, talk, I talked about my deacon friend yesterday who was evangelizing the boat driver, you know, uh, but he told me he, he knew this would probably be the last time he would see him, and so he thought he would take a chance and share the gospel with him. But most often, discipleship happens with friends, developing friendships. And so I'm sure Jesus, with his 12, they just spent a lot of time together breaking bread. I'm sure they told jokes. It's one of the things I like about um, the chosen is that you see the humanity of Jesus. He, he actually laughs. You know, sometimes he's so pious in some of these shows that, uh, you know, if we're made in the image and likeness of God, a sense of humor is a good characteristic of a human being. And so I would imagine God has a really good sense of humor. But he developed an authentic friendship with these men. The second thing focus has is divine intimacy. So as we're working with our, our friends, we're then sharing our faith life. You know, so this is where it gets challenging, right? It's easy to talk about the Cubs and the White Sox, the weather, um, the stock market, all of these things that are exterior to us. It's tough to talk about our faith because it's very intimate. It's one of the most intimate things we can do is to open up our hearts. Mike Sweeney says, intimacy is into me see. Here's my heart, and I don't want to show anybody my heart because it, it, maybe it's not where it should be. Um, so what these focused missionaries do on campuses, first they build friendships, and then they start to share their faith life with these college students. And then they do what's called spiritual multiplication. This is the faith in action. And I was at a conference, so Focus did a conference in, in Chicago a few years ago. They had about 12,000 college students at the uh, McCormick Center. Amazing. And it was an interesting, uh, we could do it here, but I'll just explain it. It's going to be quicker. So Curtis Martin was given a talk, and he had three different people, like in three different sections, stand up. And then he said, I want each of you standing up to tap three other people on the shoulder. And then those nine people stood up. Now we have 12 standing, right? Now you 12 tap three other people on the shoulder, and another 36 people stood up. And then all the people standing up, you see what I mean? And it was only, I think it was seven or eight iterations, all 12,000 people were standing. And what he was saying is, the point was, the power of spiritual multiplication is we don't have to evangelize everybody. If we invest in three people, if each of us invested in three people, we would transform all of Joliet and Shorewood in a very short amount of time. Now, you know, Jesus spent three years with his disciples, and, and that's, that was his time frame. It, it's hard to tell. Each person is different that we, that we walk with. But I found, I found this to be a very compelling uh, image, and they are doing incredible work. Like, my own niece and nephew in Colorado, uh, their lives were transformed by focus missionaries at a public university. They went to Colorado State University. My nephew now is a, uh, he's a youth minister at their parish. He, uh, he's, he's studied theology of the body. He teaches theology of the body in their diocese, and he's only 27, 28 years old. My niece is now a, a stay-at-home mom. I just found out today they're having their second child, but on fire for her faith because of these campus ministers who invested in them, spent time building a friendship, sharing uh, their, their faith life, and then start to multiply. And then another um, group that's finding great results is evangelical Catholic. And so what they have, they have what's, it looks like a wheel, 
And in the center of the wheel is Christ, of course. And then coming out of that wheel, they have prayer, scripture, the sacraments, community, evangelization, and obedience. So you find some different words there. But what do you see that's common in all of those? See, prayer? What else? Some form of, of, of study, you know, some form of, of learning, and then some form of evangelization and sharing our faith, right? You go back to what Bishop Hicks said, you know, the evangelization, catechesis, and faith in action. All of these things, everybody's kind of saying the same thing, and they're finding incredible results. And so this is the scripture that I read at the beginning. This is, I think, a foundational scripture for, for us to look at as we talk about growing in our faith because over 2,000 years, we can kind of lose our way, right? And so I, I think it's always good to go back to the source. It's like, have you ever played the telephone game? You know, where you're sitting in a circle and you tell the person, you whisper something to the person next to you and then they have to repeat it. And eventually, as it comes around the circle, it's completely different than when it started. The same thing can happen in, in, our, in our faith, in our, in our church, if we're not careful. If we can get so far away from our, our roots that we, we can lose our way. And so Acts 2.42, this is right after Jesus' resurrection and ascension into heaven. He has established this Christian community and St. Luke writes in the Acts of the Apostles, they shared four things in common. And if they're doing this, I think it's important that we should study this. They, they broke bread. And so what is that for us? It's, it's the Eucharist, right? They were celebrating Mass together, breaking the bread. They shared prayer. They shared in the teaching of the Apostles. So they were engaging their minds. They were, they were studying what the Apostles taught. And then the last thing is they shared community. The importance of walking this journey with other like-minded Christians and not trying to do it ourselves. And so, as we look at the movements that are having success in the church today, and we, we look at the early Christian community, again, you see the prayer, you see the teaching, so you, we're engaging our hearts, we're engaging our minds, and there's also this, this outreach uh, that's happening as well. So, as our, our team in the diocese started studying all of these and, and praying about it, we came up with six characteristics of, um, of a disciple of Jesus, somebody who's growing in their relationship. And so, as I'm going through these, you might think about, where am I with each one of these? Again, it's not meant to shame us if we're not doing it. It's, this is meant to say, okay, here's the ideal, and this is what we have to aim for. So, the first one, uh, and these not, are not necessarily in any order, but we're going to look at, the reason I put the crucifix there is we're going to look at a vertical axis, our relationship with God, and we're going to look at the horizontal axis, our relationship with, with one another. And so, I put almost right at the heart there are the sacraments. And what are the two that you think would be the most important for us to be practicing? Reconciliation and the Eucharist, right? These are sacraments that we can participate in, the Eucharist daily, uh, and I recommend the, the Sacrament of Reconciliation once a month. Obviously, if you have serious sin, you know, go more often. But as, as we start to practice these sacraments and participate in them, they're transformative. I remember when I, after I made my Curcio in 1993, um, I was inspired to go to daily Mass. I, I didn't go to daily Mass before that. And so I went on the Monday afterward, and then I thought that was good. I went Tuesday, and Wednesday. And about Thursday, this, this woman pulled me aside after Mass, and she said, Burke, be careful. I said, what do you mean? She said, that's how my son got started. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, he's a priest now. <laughs> What she was pointing to is, if we hear the Word of God proclaimed every day, and we receive the Eucharist on a daily basis, it's going to start to have an effect on us, whether we realize it or not. 
And I, I don't know if I've missed Mass much at all since 1993. And I can tell you as a priest, it is the favorite, my favorite thing to do, actually both sacraments, uh, the Eucharist and Reconciliation, because I know that, that God's grace is working through these sacraments. Um, so I can't emphasize that enough. These are the sacraments. I'll just say this real quickly because I, I found it very powerful. I, I heard this on the Crucio. So does anybody remember the definition of a sacrament? Kind of the, the, the catechism definition? Yep. Very good. So it's an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace, right? So, for example, what's the outward sign of the Eucharist? The bread and wine. Uh, what is the grace? It's the sacramental grace that we receive through the Eucharist. And when did Jesus institute it? At the Last Supper, right? The sacrament of reconciliation. What's the outward sign? So we need, we need a penitent and we need a priest, right? And, and so the penitent confesses his or her sins and the priest gives absolution. And so when was this instituted by Christ? Remember he told Peter when he gave him the keys to the kingdom, whatever sins you hold bound on earth will be held bound in heaven. Whatever sins you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Very scriptural. Sometimes we Catholics get beaten up like you're not scriptural. That's why it's important to study, because there's the scriptural foundation of what we do is so powerful. And so, and the grace that we receive is this, this kind of renewal, almost becoming uh, in that pure state of like our baptism. And so, the reason I'm bringing this up is, we have God the Father who sends his son Jesus into the world. Jesus, in a way, is a sacrament of the Father, an outward sign of, of grace instituted by Christ. He is Christ. Christ ascends into heaven, and who does, who does Jesus, who do, who do Jesus and the Father send? The Holy Spirit. So now the Holy Spirit becomes, you know, this sacrament, if you will, of the Father and the Son. What does the Holy Spirit uh, institute on, on Pentecost Sunday? The church. And so the Holy Spirit institutes the church for us, and then the church offers us the seven sacraments. And so the Father, through the Son, through the Holy Spirit, through the Church, they give us the sacraments. It's like the Father is loving us through the sacraments, through Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Church. Do you see that? And so sometimes we go through the motions with the sacraments, like, okay, here we go again. And uh, it's interesting, as somebody who gives communion every day, you can tell when, when people are engaged, like you can see their faith. And you can tell sometimes when people are just going through the motions, like they're getting a, a cookie or something, you know. Uh, so I believe that God has called me from being a Protestant baseball player to be a Catholic priest, is to help Catholics realize, like, do you know what you've always had? <laughs> do you know that, you know, through the, the, the Eucharist and reconciliation that God is trying to love you and fill you with his grace and give you a life of abundant joy. It's all here for us. And so the sacraments. I can go on and on. It's my favorite topic, but I'll stop there. The second characteristic is prayer. We heard that in, in you know, in Crucio and Focus and in all of those other movements. To have a daily prayer life. And so the disciples come to Jesus and say, teach us how to pray. And what does he teach them? He teaches them the Our Father. And so in the Be Formed season that we just finished, we went through book four of the Catechism. I remember Bishop Kaffer, who was Father Kaffer. He was our principal at Providence. He loved the Catechism. And he said, if you start teaching the Catechism, begin with book four, because it's all on prayer. And then go back and, and learn the other aspects of the creed and morality and, and those kind of things. But teach people how to pray. John Paul II said, our, our parishes need to be schools of prayer. Why? Because it's in prayer that we learn how to develop an intimate relationship with the Lord. That the Lord is not some distant entity, 
But as we talked about on Sunday, he's alive, and he wants to have a deep personal relationship with us. The next one is scripture. Again, on this uh, vertical axis. So, do we read scripture on a daily basis? It's one of the beauties of, if you go to daily mass, you're being, you're being filled with scripture. Over, uh, so the daily lectionary over a two-year cycle covers much of the Bible. The Sunday, how many year cycle are, is there? Three. So if you go to mass every day for three years, you're going to hear, you're going to hear it all, all the important stuff. And you may not be able to quote, you know, book and verse, but you know the stories. And so I remember Father Hennessy telling us in the seminary, he said, if you go to bed without having read scripture that day, sit up, turn your light on, make sure you have your Bible right by your bed, and at least read a few minutes of scripture. I think it's the best thing we can do before we go to bed. Have you ever had dreams based on what you were thinking about right before you went to bed? Happens to me all the time. And so he told us, read scripture bef right before you go to sleep and pay attention then to what you dream about. He said you probably sleep better, more peacefully, and you're filling your, your heart and your mind with the word of God. The word of God is alive because who is the word of God? Jesus, right? Jesus. So prayer, scripture, and the sacraments. If you read my blog, you hear this repeatedly because I think they're there are three key things that we, we do to fill our hearts with the love of Jesus. Now let's look at the horizontal axis. Community. We heard in Acts 2.42 that they shared community. We cannot do this alone. In fact, the, Jesus says, I came so that you might be one, right? And that's why we, we gather together on on Sunday as a community, and that's why the, the, the epidemic, I think, has been so devastating for people, because it, it has isolated us, it's kept us away from our church community, our, our families, and what the, what the devil wants to do, diaboline in Greek means to scatter. So if you watch, let's say, I love watching animal shows, and like if you watch a lion try to capture a wilder, wildebeest, what does it do? It looks for the weak one, right? It looks to separate them from the herd, and then they attack. And that's exactly what the devil wants to do with all of us. He wants to separate us from the community, and then attack. When, when you feel alone and isolated, what is that like? It's horrible, right? And you feel so defenseless. But when you are surrounded by community, when you have friends, in faith, and you know that they've got your back, there is strength in that. And so that's why, you know, watching Mass on, on TV is better than nothing, but not much better than nothing. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's nothing. What I want to say is, here's nothing, here's watching Mass on TV, and then here's coming to Mass. You're, you're experiencing community, and most importantly, you're receiving the Eucharist, which is, you know, one of the greatest gifts that Jesus has given us. And so, community, the second thing on the horizontal axis is acts of service. So, I remember Bishop Barron telling us in seminary, he said, if you're struggling with your faith, go serve somebody. Because what often happens is, he says, we navel gaze, uh, I think it was St. Augustine who said sin is a, a curvature in say, meaning it's a turning in on ourselves. And again, in a pandemic time, we, it's hard not to look, just look at our belly button, right? But when we go and serve somebody, you know, how many of you have done like mission trips, either locally or inter internationally? What is that like? You always get more than you, than you give, right? That's the economy of Christ. When we serve somebody, it takes the focus off of our own struggles, and we, you know, he fills us more than we can even give to other people. Again, that's how we're created, to give our lives away. And so, are you participating in any kind of acts of service for uh, your, your community? It's part of being Christian. 
And then the, the last characteristic, and there could be more, but we, we tried to narrow it down to these six, is evangelization. Again, it's not necessarily preaching. And I have to say this, uh, you know, St. Francis is often quoted as saying what? Preach the gospel always, and when necessary, use words. There is no evidence that he ever said that. <laughs> There's, there's nothing in writing as anybody's ever found to say St. Francis said that, but it, it's been attributed to him. Whatever it is, it's a good, it's a good quote. Um, so we can evangelize in many different ways. And sometimes it's using words. Sometimes it's, you know, serving. Sometimes it's giving people a good book, whatever that may be. Okay? So think about these six characteristics and maybe do a little personal inventory. Where, where do I need to grow? What can I start with? What we do in Be Formed is we encourage people to pick one or two things and to focus on it. If you, if you say, I'm going to do four different things in each of these areas, you're going to overwhelm yourself and you're going to throw in the towel. Have you ever done that at the beginning of Lent? Like, I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to fast six times a week and I'm going to go to Mass three times a day and all of these things. We, we go crazy and then by day two you can't do it all and then you do nothing. And just throw in the towel. But if you pick one or two things and say, okay, I'm, I'm going to work on reading scripture five minutes a day, and I'm going to go to Mass one more time this week, then I'm going to go to Mass on Sunday and maybe on Wednesday. Start there. And when you, when you find something you say, I can do that, it builds up confidence, and then you can start to expand as, as you start to build these good habits, Right? We don't lose 100 pounds at a time. We lose weight one pound at a time. So of primary importance, who's at the center? Of course, Jesus. Whatever we do, we have to put Jesus at the center. One of the things that Pope Francis said early on in his pontificate, and I, it really resonated in my heart, he said, we need to talk less about the church and more about Jesus. He wasn't denigrating the church at all. But what he is saying is, we need to talk about the person of Jesus Christ. Listen to our conversations a lot at church and, and outside of church. I, I hear it a lot. People will say, I'm really close to my faith, or I'm close to the church. And those are not bad things. But for some reason, it's hard for us to say, I'm in love with Jesus, or I'm really, I really feel close to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Because I think, again, it, it gets to be very personal and, and intimate. And so I think that's what Pope Francis was encouraging us to, to, to dive more into our relationship with the person of Jesus Christ. Second thing, allowing his grace and the Holy Spirit to transform us. Again, this is where Crucio was so big for me. It was understanding the power of grace. Grace is God's divine life that he wants to pour into us, and the Holy Spirit. We talked uh, yesterday, there was a priest that I know that he carries his rosary around all day, and when, he's, when he has idle time, he just says, come Holy Spirit, on each bead. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. It's a reminder for him, he says, to not rely on his own strength, but to ask the Holy Spirit to inform everything he says and does. That would be huge. We talked about the sacraments, right? Eucharist, Mass. We haven't talked about um, adoration. And I'm going to have Melissa key up the, the video. Um, so adoration of the Blessed Sacrament was another game changer for me. Uh, it was actually my, my girlfriend at the time introduced me to adoration. I'd never heard of it before. I'd been Catholic nine years. And it was in that silence and adoration sitting before Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, that I started to hear, I want you to be a priest. And uh, it, was, it was a game changer. So we're going to watch this video. How many of you have seen the veil removed? Okay, there's a handful. This, uh, it's a seven-minute video on the Mass. And under, what they're trying to do is to show what's going on beneath the surface. What you see is one thing, What's really going on at the spiritual level is another. So let's uh, go up that video.
have sight, your faith has saved you. The Gospel of the Lord. So with the angels and all the saints, we declare your glory. As with one voice we claim. bread and giving thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take this all of you and eat of it for this is my body which will be given up for you would stay away from Mass if they <laughs> knew that was happening. <laughs> but the angels and saints, you know, when we sing holy, 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 the angels and saints, were, they call it the heavenly liturgy. It's like the heavens open up and we're participating in what's going on in heaven constantly. I encourage you to read the book The Lamb's Supper by Scott Hahn. If you've never read that, L-A-M-B-S, The Lamb's Supper. He describes what they portray in this movie, and it's all based in scripture, what's happening at Mass. Uh, we talked about reconciliation. Scripture. I encourage you, as I mentioned, Sister Margaret Ann had me read the Gospel of Matthew. So if you're looking at where do I start reading scripture, I would start with one of the Gospels, 
or I would start with the, the, the readings for daily mass. Um, those are places where uh, you know, the church has laid out the readings for the mass in a, in a cycle. That would be a good place to start as well. But the, the gospels will get you that, lead you into that deeper intimacy with Jesus. Um, and I, I say there you can share a chapter a week with your friends or disciples. You know, a great way to share friendship and divine intimacy is, is studying scripture together with friends. And then the prayer. So we talked about prayer, scripture, sacraments. Um, Lexio Divina. It's the sacred reading of scripture. And we don't have time tonight to, to teach Lexio Divina. But you can find... Um, there's, there's short videos online that kind of walk you through steps. Even in our Be Formed, uh, Katie has some videos on our, our Be Formed YouTube page that walks you through the steps of Lexio Divina and can help you with that. And the ARRR... This is a method that we were taught in the seminary. Uh, it's called the Pirate Prayer because of the acronym there. R. Uh, it's acknowledge, relate, receive, respond. Again, I'm not going to go into detail, but acknowledge, relate, receive, respond. So when you sit down to pray, let's say you have 10 minutes. I'm going to take two and a half minutes to acknowledge what's going on inside of my heart. Uh, oftentimes we're not even aware of what's going on inside, right? And that's why that silence is so important, to be aware of what's happening in our lives. The first R, then, is relate that to God. Whatever's going on inside, talk to God out of this. Think about sitting down with your best friend. This is what you do, really. This is what's going on. I'm acknowledging what's going on inside. I talk to them about it. And then you receive, you listen to the other person. And it's hard to receive from Lord, the Lord because you're like, well, God doesn't speak to me. He may not speak to you audibly, but if you give him quiet time, he's going to speak to your heart. And then uh, acknowledge, relate, receive, respond. Every prayer demands a response. It might be thanksgiving. It might be, have you ever had the experience when you're praying and, and a person keeps coming to mind? Maybe God's asking you to call that person, to forgive that person, to write that person, whatever it is. But pay attention to what's going on in prayer and what is God asking of me. Acknowledge, relate, receive, respond. So as we know, the, the Eucharist is the source and summit of our faith. The latest statistics are dismal, right? Two-thirds of Catholics do not believe in the real presence. Two-thirds. And again, I think this is one of the calls I feel is to help, you know, the, the Eucharist is why I became Catholic it's why I became a priest, and it's why I remain a priest. And it is what distinguishes the Catholic Church from any other church. And if you talk to, how many uh, converts do we have here besides me? Who else has converted to the Catholic faith? Would most of you, would it be because of the Eucharist as a, as a big part of it? Most, most converts would say, this is why I became Catholic. That's why we want to encourage you who've grown up to be ca grown up Catholic, to say, you know, if you don't believe, look at what you have. And the, the scriptural foundations are, are solid and strong. Um, and people like Scott Hahn, who was a brilliant scripture scholar and uh, Presbyterian minister, he went to Mass to prove it was the worst thing ever created by man. And it converted him to be a Catholic apologist. <laughs> and so it, it's not... Um, it's not just something that is emotional and feelings. Like these are, these are people who have big brains <laughs> and big hearts. And the Eucharist is what draws us. I'm not putting myself in that big brain category, but it, it draws us in. So why do we believe? Because Jesus said so. <laughs> That's the first reason. You know, think about this. When Jesus says something, it happens. Going back to Genesis, God spoke and the world was created. Because he is the word of God, he's the word made flesh, whatever he says happens. He created the world. And so when he says to the leper, be healed, what happens? He's healed. When he says to Lazarus, rise from the dead, he rises from the dead. 
So when Jesus says, this is my body, it's his body. When he said, this is my blood, it's his blood. And so when the priest is consecrating here at the altar, we are acting what's called in persona Christi. We are acting in the person of Christ. That's why in the video, you see the priest actually becomes Jesus. It's because Jesus is the one who's consecrating. It's not the priest. So Jesus is the, the priest. He's also the victim. He's also the one being sacrificed. And we say that the altar is Jesus as well. And so there's so many things happening at Mass that, like, I'll use the ex <laughs> This is a weak analogy, but baseball again. How many of you don't like baseball? It's okay. So I've had people tell me baseball is the most boring game in the world. Golf is. <laughs> what I want to say is, like, do you know what's happening behind every pitch? Like, you know, the, the coaches are they're studying the statistics. They're sending a, a, a pitch into the catcher. The catcher's giving the sign to the pitcher. The fielders are watching what sign the catcher's giving so they know where to position themselves. They know in their mind the tendencies of the hitter. All of this is happening that we don't see. And yet, to the, to the untrained eye, it looks like it's really boring. Similarly, or analogously, there's so much happening at Mass, like this video is trying to portray, that we don't see, but it doesn't mean it's not happening. And so, uh, so Jesus says it's his body and blood. Just some other little statistic, or, uh, interesting facts that Bethlehem, where Jesus was born, means house of bread in Hebrew, and in Arabic it means house of flesh. Interestingly, the place where the word of God became, uh, you know, uh, he's the bread of life, but he also gave his flesh for the life of the world. Uh, the word Bethlehem means both bread and, f and flesh, house of bread, house, house of flesh in the two languages. The Passover connections, our ties to our Jewish ancestry. You know, what, what would they do? They, at the Passover, they would sacrifice the unblemished lamb. And interestingly, I, I, I learned this in the Holy Land, that when a shepherd found an unblemished lamb, they would gather it up because they tried to keep it from getting bruised. They would wrap it in swaddling clothes. And so a first century Jew, when they heard that Jesus was wrapped in swaddling clothes, boom, they're going to think unblemished lamb. At Mass, we sing the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Where was he born? He was born in a manger where animals eat. So he was born in a place where he was meant to be eaten, that his flesh was meant to be eaten. When, when the Jews sacrificed the unblemished lamb, they ate the flesh. We eat his body. They put the blood on the lintel of the door, and the angel of death passed over any house that had that blood on the door. We, out, outside of COVID, we drink the blood, and so that blood is on our lips so that the angel of death passes over us. Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And so what he's trying to say is, this is my flesh and blood for the life of the world. When we receive the Eucharist, he's claiming us as his own. He's like putting a mark on us saying, you belong to me and I'm going to protect you. And then another thing is Eucharistic miracles. I could go on and on about these, but I just got back from Italy. We went to Lanciano, probably the oldest and most famous Eucharistic miracle, where this priest who didn't believe in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, as he's consecrating at Mass, he was going to leave the priesthood because he said, if I don't believe, what am I doing being a priest? And so before his eyes, the bread turns into flesh, and the, the wine turns into blood. That happened in um, 1,200 years ago. It's still intact to this day. I celebrated Mass with the miracle right behind me. Scientists have studied this. Scientists who don't, so they're given a, a, a specimen, and they don't know what they're studying, that it's this miracle. Uh, many of them are not Catholic. And what they find is it's always, in all of these miracles, it's always the human heart uh, that has often gone through something like torture, crucifixion, and they can find 
you know, all of the different pieces of the heart are present in these miracles. The blood is always type AB blood. Interestingly, the same type of blood that was found on the Shroud of Turin. And so, I think what God's trying to do, and Jesus is saying, I know it's hard to believe, but I'm here. And he's trying to show us that, um, that he's with us, to not be afraid. And so, I encourage you to study these Eucharistic miracles. We went to uh, uh, Cassia, where St. Rita of Cassia is from, and there's another Eucharistic miracle that happened there. There's one in Orvieto. There's one in, in um, just recently, there was one in, is it Argentina, I believe? And I think Pope Francis, when he was uh, the archbishop down there, was part of that investigation. They're, they're all over the place. So I want to share a little bit about Be Formed. I've mentioned it here, um, <clears throat> and I know some of you are participating in Be Formed. This is something that came out of the pandemic. You know, it, God always brings good out of bad. And so uh, Bishop Conlon asked me four years ago, he said, I want you to learn, take what you learned forming seminarians and bring it to the lay faithful. And so uh, when I would go visit our seminarians at the seminary, we would look at these four pillars of formation. And here they are, human, spiritual, intellectual, and pastoral. So they say grace builds on nature. So we would start with the human. Things like, uh, let's just sleep, diet, and exercise. Sounds kind of silly, right? But if we're not taking care of our bodies, there's nothing upon which to build. So if, we're, if we have sh shifting sand underneath us, it's hard to build a prayer life. So we encourage the guys, try to get seven hours of sleep. Try to eat well and get exercise at least three times a week. You know, I remember at my ordination, so, you know, I'm the only Catholic in my family, and all of the priests, you know, about 100 priests process in for the ordination, and my, my family's never been around this before, and, but what, what my brothers noticed were that many of our priests were, let's say, out of shape. <laughs> And they were taking bets on, you know, when I was going to go over 300 pounds. Uh, <laughs> so the seminarians, you know, this is one thing I really focused on when, on our seminarians is, you know, in order to have the energy to do what we need to do as priests, we, we need to keep, stay in shape. We need to exercise. And, you know, I, I got after him about this. So we, we first look at our human formation. Then we can start building a spiritual life, you know, forming the heart, talking about our prayer life prayer, scripture, and the sacraments, right? Then we look at our intellectual life, forming the mind, loving God with our mind. Matthew Kelly says we should read five pages of a good Catholic book every day. I love this incremental spirituality because he said, if we read five pages of a good book every day, in 25 years, you will have read 221 full books of average length, 200 pages. If I told you to go read 221 books, you would say, hey, forget it. But can you read five pages? You can do that. It probably takes 10, 15 minutes, depending on, on the book, right? But what happens is, if you develop the habit of doing that every day, wow, you're going to form your mind, and your, your mind and heart will start to become integrated as a disciple of Christ. Uh, and so what we do in Be Formed is we do 90-day segments. Uh, it's kind of like a semester, and we have a different topic. So right now we're, we're studying the Mass, actually. We're studying the Liturgy of the Word, the first half of the Mass. In January, we're going to start the Liturgy of the Eucharist and kind of go into what, what that veil removed uh, talks about. And then the fourth pillar is pastoral, putting our faith into action. So we believe that if we fill our hearts and minds with the love of God, it naturally pours forth into action. And so what we have for Be Formed is a commitment card. And what we do is we have about 10 things listed in each one of these four categories. So for example, what we encourage people to do is to say, I'm going to pick two, two things from here. I'm, gonna work, I'm just going to work on getting seven hours of sleep and I'm going to work on reading five pages of a good Catholic book. That's all I'm going to work on. 
And what happens is when you start to build those habits of those two things, other things start to fall into place even without you, you know, working on it. We talked about this vertical axis. You know, what are, what are the three things again? You should be picking them up now. Prayer, sacraments, and scripture. PSS, prayer, sacraments, and scripture. So prayer, scripture, and the sacraments. So these are three things that uh, we're looking at at the ver vertical axis for be formed. And then on the horizontal axis, Oops, there we go. What, what, what is it? Community, service, and evangelization, right? So we have the community aspect there. And so what we do in Be Formed is we form small groups of about six to ten people. Within your small group, you're, you're given a prayer partner. And so daily, it might just be a text, you're checking in with your prayer partner about what they're, what they're working on. And what happens, we find, is when there's accountability and encouragement, that's where growth happens. So when we do our Lenten observances, we often don't have any accountability, right? Like I always give up, I would, in the past, I would always give up chocolate, and then I'd always fall somewhere along the line, and like, well, I blew it now, and then I just, I just give up. But what we're doing in Be Formed is we have somebody there that's like your, your cheerleader and, and, and coach, and you're doing it for each other. You're the only two that knows what the other person's working on, but there's that encouragement. So we have uh, that daily check-in with your prayer partner. The small group meets weekly, and then we have a large group. We have, we have over 1,000 people participating in B-Form right now, and so we do a large Zoom group uh, once a month. Then we have service. We encourage uh, prayer partners and groups to do acts of service in their parish and larger community, and then to think about, uh, and we're not asking people to jump into evangelization right away, but little by little, as we start to be formed, we're going to be more and more uh, equipped and ready to evangelize. We talked about this yesterday, being intentional. Practically, what, what do we do? We spend time and intentionality with a few people. Maybe start with one, one or two people. We build that friendship, and we share our, our faith life, our divine intimacy. And what all of these groups that do this are finding, these, these things lead to people developing a zeal for souls. Meaning, like my desire is that people come to know Christ. That is the, the deep burning desire that the Lord wants in all of us. And if it's not there, it's okay. But that's where, that's the goal again uh, of all that we're doing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just go through, we've kind of all already covered that. Oops. Sorry. So second base. So we talked about first base is that, that encounter, evangelization, coming to know Jesus. Now, first to second is this growing. And there comes a point where we say, we talked about being all in, right? I'm all in. And St. Peter did it when he said to, to Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of everlasting life. Like, I'm not going anywhere else. The Lord wants to get us to this point where we say, boy, Lord, I, I've tried to find happiness in my job. I've tried to find happiness in other people in alcohol, whatever it may be, whatever our go-to thing is, I've come to believe that you are the one that I've been waiting for. And then we're going to start into tomorrow with the um, faith in action. So transformation, what do we talk about? I want to save room for my last video here and we'll, we'll end at 8.30. So Assuming that you have tr that you've built trust with someone and you've gone through those thresholds, uh, we talked about the thresholds last night of, of trust, curiosity, openness, seeking, and then discipleship. Um, we can see that in last night's video. So what are, we, what are we trying to do now? Start by rooting out sin. 
You know, if I'm walking with somebody just, that's just starting out, I say, where are the major areas of sin in our lives, that, the obvious things that we can begin by, by rooting out? And then we can start fine-tuning by saying, am I allowing every part of my life to be transformed by the Lord? You know, my marriage, my friendships, my money, sexuality, vacation and leisure, material possessions. What you find is, as you develop this relationship with the Lord, these things start to take on different meanings in our lives. Remember, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas calls the four substitutes for God. Anybody remember them? Honor, power, pleasure, and wealth. Honor, power, pleasure, and wealth. As Jesus starts to become the center of our lives, these things start to fade away. They start to lose their their glimmer in our lives. We look at what's happening in my prayer life. What am I reading? I might go from reading, you know, romance novels to, you know, Matthew Kelly or Thomas Aquinas or whatever it may be. And people have asked me, like, is there a book that you would start with? It really depends. There's so many good books out there. Um, so my, my brother, who's kind of having this resurgence in his faith, he's now in my Beform group. That's the beauty of Beform can be in person or virtual. So I've got my brother in Denver, whose his heart's catching fire now. And so I, I encouraged him to read um, Rediscovering Jesus by Matthew Kelly. It's a good kind of reintroduction to the person of Jesus Christ. Um, but depending on where the person is, that, that might determine what book they're going to read. And am I starting to see the fruits of the Holy Spirit? Am I growing in charity and in peace and joy? Last thing here. I believe that part of growing as a disciple, healing is essential. I remember thinking, when I thought of about healing. I thought about televangelists, you know, where they would lay hands on people and people would fall. I'm like, I don't want anything to do with that. It it seemed kind of phony. But when I I met Dr. Bob Schutz, who wrote the book Be Healed, um, he grounds it in scripture and in the catechism, and it's not fanatical or emotional. It's just very, you know, this is how it is. Read the scriptures through the lens of healing, And you're going to find Jesus was constantly healing. What he was trying to do is to free people up to become the disciples he created them to be. For example, have you ever said something, and then as soon as the words came out of your mouth, you try to grab them back? Like, why did I say that? Or have you ever done something, and as soon as you did it, like, ah, why did I say that? It's because we're wounded. We, we We have compulsions out of our woundedness. St. Paul says, I do the things I don't want to do, and I don't do the things that I should. So the more that we find healing, the more free we become to, to not act out of compulsion, but to act out of freedom. And so that's why we've started these Be Healed retreats based on Dr. Bob Schutz's book. And actually we have Dr. Bob and Sister Miriam uh, coming to Notre Dame in just a couple weeks. There's, actually, there's only about 40 spots left, and I highly encourage you to go. We had somebody sign up from Ireland the other day. So we have people coming from other countries to Clarendon Hills for this conference. I'm trying to get people like, again, does anybody know Sister Miriam James? She is a rock star. She was a Division I volleyball player. She's probably taller than I am. She's about 40 years old, and she's on fire. She's very open about her addiction to alcohol. She was a Division I volleyball player in California and was addicted to alcohol and, you know, just lived this life of promiscuity. She's very, she says that out loud. But through this healing process, she's found this freedom. She's one of the most compelling speakers I, I've ever heard. And so she's going to be right here in our diocese, November 4th, 5th, and 6th. Um, but what I want to show you here... And I've got the, the details of those here. Um, so it's the John Paul II Healing Center, and the Healing the Whole Person, November 4, 5, and 6. And we have men's and women's Be Healed retreats 
We're the only diocese that Dr. Bob is allowing to use his material with him not being present. So he, he trusts us with his stuff. We've had about, I think, 600 people from our diocese go through these retreats, and people are finding new freedom. I want to... Uh, it's almost going to finish here. We're going to get ready for this other clip. You ready, Melissa? So, th again, this is another clip from The Chosen. Uh, so to set this up, Jesus is going to Jacob's well, and he's going to have this encounter with the Samaritan woman. Um, I'm, I'll just share with you, I, I always have my, my handkerchief ready watching this. <laughs> it's, one of, it's my favorite scene of the whole two seasons. So let's watch this, and then we'll, f we'll finish up. Give me a drink. Did you hear me? That's bad, huh? What? You, would you ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan? And a woman? I'm sorry. I should have said please. You know, it's not safe for you to be alone out here. Nor you. Why haven't you come with others? Why so late in the day? Don't women come to the wells in the, the cool of the morning? Yeah, well, none of them will be seen with me, so I have to come at noon in the heat. So you have so kindly reminded me. Why won't they be seen with you? Long story. I'd, I'd still like a drink of water if, if you can spare it. Amazing what a parched throat will do. Aren't I unclean to you? Won't you be defiled by this vessel? Maybe some of my people say that about your women, but I don't. Yeah? And what do you say? I say if you knew who I am, you'd be asking me for a drink. Really? And I would give you living water. Would, except that you have nothing to throw water with, and this is a deep well. Besides, what do you need from me if you have your own supply of living water? Wrong story. But Jewish water is better than Samaritan water. Hmm? That's not what I said. Are you a better man than our ancestor Jacob, who dug this well? Your water is better than his? I know Jacob. And everyone who drinks this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. Wouldn't that be nice? The water I give will become in a person a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Really? Yes, really. Prove it. First, go and call your husband and come back. I will show you both. I don't have a husband. You are right. You've had five husbands. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. <laughs> oh, I see. You're a prophet. You're here to preach at me. No. Usually the one good thing about coming here alone is I can escape being condemned. I'm not here to condemn you. I've made mistakes. Too many. But it's men like you who have made it impossible for me to do anything about it. How? Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews insist Jerusalem is the only place for true worship. They say that because the temple is there. Yeah, exactly where we're not allowed. I'm here to break those barriers. 
and the time is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. So, where am I supposed to go when I need God? I've never received anything from God, but I couldn't thank him even if I did. Anywhere. God is spirit. And the time is coming and is now here. That it won't matter where you worship, but only that you do it in spirit and truth. Heart and mind, that, that is the kind of worshiper he's looking for. It won't matter where you're from or what you've done. Do you believe what I'm telling you? Until the Messiah comes and explains everything and sorts this mess out, including me, I don't trust in anyone. You're wrong when you say that you have never received anything from God. This Messiah you speak of, I am he. The first one was named Ramin. You were a woman of purity who was excited to be married. But he wasn't a good man. He hurt you. And it made you question marriage and even the practice of your faith. Stop it. The second was Farzad. On your wedding night, his skin smelled like oranges. And to this day, every time you pass by the oranges in the market, you feel guilty for leaving him because he was the only truly godly man you've been with. But you felt unworthy. Why are you doing this? I have not revealed myself to the public as the Messiah. You are the first. It would be good if you believed me. You picked the wrong person. I came to Samaria just to meet you. <laughs> Do you think it's an accident that I'm, I'm here in the middle of the day? I am rejected by others. I know. But not by the Messiah. And you know these things because you are the Christ. I'm going to tell everyone. I was counting on it. <laughs> Spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. It won't be all about mountains or temples. Soon. Just the heart. You promise. I promise. This man told me everything I've done. Oh, he must be the Christ. <laughs> Your water! You forgot your um. <laughs> There's so much in there. One of the things that struck me here, he said uh, to worship heart and mind. Do you hear that? We've been talking about growing in love with our heart, and then growing in love with, our, with the Lord, with our mind as well. But the story of the, the woman at the well is so powerful because that well represents, for her, it was, if I just find the right man, then I'll be happy. For each one of us, we all have our well, don't we? We keep going back to whatever is in that well, thinking, if I just get the right whatever, then I'll be happy. And Jesus is saying, but if you drink from this well, you'll never thirst again. And so he invites us all to think about what's, what's in our well. What do we keep going back to, looking for satisfaction like she did for five husbands and another man she was living with? 
And how can we give our lives over to Christ? He wasn't there to condemn her. He loved it. He said, I came to Samaria just for you. That individual, particular love that God has for each one of us. And we may think we're unworthy. We may think that God can't love me. Those are all lies. He didn't condemn her. He just loved her. And the love transformed her life. And she became really one of the first evangelists. I'm going to tell everybody about this man who told me everything I ever did. And he knows all of our sins. He could name them right, out, right down the line for us. Not to condemn us, but he brings us back there to heal us. And that's a little glimpse of what we do at these Be Healed retreats. So quickly, the resources, and then we'll close in prayer. The best resource that we have, <laughs> the Holy Spirit, right? Um, you can go on our adult formation to find more out about Be Formed. There's going to be registration for the, the January season. It's going to, registration will start the middle of November. Um, if you want to learn more about Scripture, we have a biblical institute here in our diocese that goes through every, every book in the Bible over four years. Sorry for the scratching here. Um, if you want to do some ongoing formation online, Dayton University or the Catechetical Institute out of uh, Franciscan University. And we've teamed up with Mundelein Seminary, a lay leadership program. I'll have, this, this will all be recorded on Facebook, so you can go back and get those, those links. Um, there's also links here for our upcoming retreats. The Be Healed retreats, we offer silent retreats. There's my blog. I saw some of you and a bunch of people register last night. Um, the Curcio we did last night. Fishers of Men. I know we, how many Fishers of Men participants do we have here? I know I've met some of you. What's that? Oh, Fishers of Men. So it's a so we have a Fishers of Men group for men, and then we have Women of the Way uh, for women. So these are specialized ministries for for men and women. And then uh, the JP2 Healing Center is Dr. Bob Schutz. Uh, information. And then I know some of you have already bought the book Man Your Post. That has, I, I wrote a chapter in it. Uh, Mike Sweeney, the baseball player, um, forward by Scott Hahn. Those are, those are $20 available in the Narthex. So just questions for us to ponder tonight as we close in prayer. Um, where do I need to grow? So is it, is it in prayer? Is it learning more about the teaching of the apostles, loving God with my mind? Is it being part of a, a, a community, a small Christian community, a parish? Is it participating in the sacraments? From These are all from Acts 2.42. Things for us to ponder. And so tomorrow night we're going to talk about how do we take this and then take it out into the world? How do we put our faith into action we're going to go for an hour tomorrow, and then we're going to finish with a half hour of adoration. Hopefully, just to have time to process uh, what, what you've heard, and maybe talk to the Lord about where he might be calling each one of us individually to, uh, for our next steps in growth. So let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, we... We thank you for sending your son Jesus to us, for his incredible love. Thank you for not condemning us or shaming us, but wanting to heal us and to save us, to have us live with you for all eternity. Give us the gift of faith and trust. Help us to turn over each part of our lives even those parts of our lives that have caused us shame or embarrassment. We want to be healed. We want to be whole. We want to become the disciples that you have created us to be. We want to be free. We want to love. And we want to be loved. Mother Mary, I just ask you to wrap your mantle around each one of us and help us fall in love with your son, Jesus. Holy Spirit, inspire us, fill us, guide us, enliven us. 
We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We're going to finish with our closing song. It's up there. Thy word. Please stand. Thy word is a lamp unto